Hi, I'm Connor Byrne, and before we get started into this episode of That's What I Call Marketing, just a reminder that we have a live event coming up in Dublin on September 28th featuring Caroline Donlan of Sky Ireland and Paul Durbin, who is currently CMO of the National Lottery. You can get your tickets by registering for free on That's What I Call Marketing.com. Hi, I'm Connor Byrne, and this is That's What I Call Marketing, the podcast where you will hear from the leading lights in the marketing world and listen to their unique insights. Today, I am joined by Cahill Gillen, co-founder of Distinctive Brand Asset Research and Tracking Agency, Distinctive Bat. Cahill has a background in agency and client side and has held marketing effectiveness roles in the likes of William Grant and Sons. Cahill set up the agency in 2021 and works with clients like Betfair, LinkedIn, Lipton and Kerrygold. So, yes, this episode is all about distinctiveness. What it means, the value of it, how it can be measured, why you should care about it, and where does differentiation fit into the whole picture. And we discuss some of the articles Cahill and the team share on their side, like the debranding of brands. So, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Of course, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you get updated when our next episode lands. Carl, thanks a million for joining me on That's What I Call Marketing. Great to, great to have you. Uh, lovely to be here, Connor. Uh, first question is, uh, Carl, quite an Irish name. Do you, do you get people struggling with that outside this, uh, the shores? Oh, always, always. In every job I've worked in, when we're working with uh, people from outside of Ireland, it's always, uh, it's always a common laugh that I get from colleagues uh, in terms of how people pronounce my name. I have a, co- a, a client at the moment who get on with them very well and they just decided to call me Kat. So now when we're on the call, she go, hi Kat. So like, I'm like, I'm not precious, so it doesn't bother me. Uh, but I most actually saw another client uh, recently and they do put the spelling in their Zoom yeah. and or the, how, to, how to say it correctly in the Zoom. So I must start doing that because it is, it is a hard name. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's always interesting. I always find, you know, there was names like, you know, Ether, the American colleagues, which is, oh, I don't even know where to start. But like, there's all, like, yeah, so it's that. Uh, anyway, sorry, that's a complete uh, tangent to what we're here to talk about. Although maybe not, because, you know, it's quite a distinctive name. So we'll, you've touched on uh, a bit of your, maybe your past. You, you've worked in uh, agencies and client side. Can you just tell me like a bit of, bit about kind of that history and kind of where you, where you got to say, I think like there was performance marketing in your past as well. Yeah, no, I've had a varied enough career from a marketing perspective. And so far I studied marketing in college. So a degree in marketing from DIT, um, which is one of the, well, I would okay. say it, but one of the best uh, marketing colleges and courses in Ireland, if not Europe. And Johnny Cal, so Johnny Cal will probably agree with you there as well. I think. Sorry? Yeah. Johnny Cal will probably agree with you there. <laughs> exactly. Um, and yeah, I started off in doing advertising sales, working at a publishing and entertainment company, moved into media land, not too far after working in sort of, uh, digital led advertising agencies and creative agencies, worked in different client services roles, strategy roles. Um, and yeah, I really got a good overview of the, the whole marketing spectrum. It was probably quite digital biased, uh, which is interesting in terms of where I've ended up. Yeah. Uh, then moved into client side and worked in sort of content connections, media planning type roles, and eventually marketing effectiveness roles, where uh, I still am today. Um, and I suppose it was that pivot from sort of more digital led into sort of the more effective side of things, I think that would give me a good background. And uh, I, always, I always find it funny when I like, think back to the things I said uh, when I was in a more digital led role in terms of talking about how you have to do personalization or whatever it might be and all the whatever it was popular at that time of day and then just thinking back and learning from effectiveness studies and reading the long and short of it whatever in terms of uh, how a lot of we, what we spoke about in the heyday of digital was not really true um, <laughs> and I think we were you know we're drinking the Kool-Aid or, 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 or worse uh, when it comes to digital so uh, I think we're at a good spot now in terms of we know the strengths and a lot of the weaknesses of, of digital-led activity as well and even the word digital, I know, is people don't like it being used. And yeah, yeah. Things, but uh, it's obviously uh, still a, a critical and important piece. But yeah, and I worked in marketing, uh, performance marketing as well. So I was always in the sort of the numbers side of things and uh, from an analytical perspective. And I suppose I have that breadth as well across a lot of specialist roles. And now here I am in the marketing effectiveness world of uh, distinctive brand assets. Yeah, I'll get on to that. And by, just to that point, I kind of the digital time. And when I... Sp- 
spoke to Peter Field to kind of mark the 10 year anniversary of the long and short, but we, we actually talked a bit about the context at the time because was so new or maybe not then, but, you know, definitely 15 years ago, like it was, it was new. People were just trying to figure it out. And so, you know, it was a lot of, the, the evidence wasn't probably there, or at least not pulled together in a good way for us to have more, you know, robust principles, I think, which, you know, to be fair in ourselves. Yeah, and it was, and I suppose a lot of hot takes in terms of how the yeah. strengths of, of digital, um, and as you said, there wasn't as much, um, I suppose, evidence in terms of where its strengths lied. Um, so we, you know, there was a lot of crazy statements or, you know, it, like anything in marketing, unfortunately, we are a sucker for new and shiny things. So when those new and shiny things come along, we, we all gravitate towards them. And it was evident, obviously, you know, consumers move towards digital and, you know, especially from a, a smartphone perspective in terms of 15, yeah. 20 years ago. And, you know, every brand had to have an app or, you know, yeah. or, or they were, you know, it was, it was mad if you didn't have an iPhone app or whatever. And just like, now we're looking back, you're like, why, why would you, unless you're a, a Ryan Ayer or a Nero Lingus or a Paddy Power or something like that. But, yeah. and you know, we didn't all need apps and then there was Facebook and everyone needed a Facebook app when that was a thing. Oh yeah. So, yeah. We were just, it's, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting space, but I think, you know, they're obviously the consumers uh, over the last 15, 20 years where we're moving towards digital consumption. So we eventually, it made sense to move towards it, but I suppose we probably didn't move towards it in the right way. And again, shiny things in marketing, it's, uh, we're terrible at it. So we just gravitate towards them too much. And yeah. Um, but again, I think we're, I think we're in a much better spot now, thanks to the work of, as you mentioned, the works of Peter Fields and Des Benes and Byron Sharp and Mark Ritson and all the, 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 the widely known uh, personalities out there at the moment. So I think we are in a much better spot. Yeah, definitely. And so you, you went out on your own three years ago and set up your own, would you call, is it an agency? Is it a consultancy? How would you describe it? Yeah, so it, it, we started like about two, three years ago, but it wasn't really a full-time um, consultancy at that point. It only really started uh, being full-time in the past year and a half, uh, two years. So yeah, we're, we're, um, we're a, a distinctive brand asset research consultancy. So we focus on helping brands research their distinct brand assets and attract them over time. Uh, and very much a big part of that is, I suppose, the added value of our recommendations in terms of how to bring it to life. So we'd, we'd work with brand and insights teams in terms of what the results mean from like how you can take it forward, um, in developing a strategy or a plan or whatever it might be, or how that, how do you think of brand assets would fall into the overall uh, brand Bible or whatever, or whatever the, the brand team would use. Um, and having SAS, you know, agency side and having SAS client side as well, uh, have part of the team also client side as well. It's, it's useful. I think it's a, we're, we're quite grounded in terms of our recommendations. I like to think in terms of what, what's possible and what's feasible, knowing things like cogs and all the fun things that you learn when you're working client side and, um, what's, you know, we all have great ideas, but then the practicalities of when you get into manufacturing or whatever can be very, very different. So, um, yeah, so we're, we, we, we call ourselves a research consultancy. So it is the research, but also we do help, uh, we just don't leave the rules on the table and walk away. We very much, uh, work very closely with our insights and brands teams. And what made you then, what made you go into this? I mean, you had, I see you had kind of effect, you were in an effectivist role, yeah. but what made you kind of go actually distinctiveness is a thing. I, w I want to do and be known for. Yeah, it's, um, I suppose, obviously I, I follow closely the work of Ehrenberg Bass and read all the books over the years and, you know, really bought into the theory of practicalities and the marketing science that they, they've developed and, and, and helped land. So, uh, you know, I've always been a fan of their work, like a lot of people in marketing. Um, I would have ran and managed a lot of global ha brand health trackers in, in my last role in a large drinks company. Um, and so really the power of distinctive brand assets, like they're not new, um, you know, yeah. brand codes or whatever have been around for years. And, you know, there's plenty of examples of whether that's the Michelin man or whoever they've been around their distinctive assets, but the, the marketing science and the terminology has really been brought to the fore by the, by the work, great work of Jenny Romnick. Um, and yeah, I just really, uh, you know, I just really bought into it in terms of the, its strengths. Um, and we saw that there was a need for, I suppose, uh, an offering such as ours to help brands um, do the research in a cost-effective way uh, and very much the tracking side of things as well. So we've looked at, you know, syndicated trackers in some categories that some brands we work with as well. And then the consultancy side of things, so really making it practical in terms of how um, clients and brands landed. So it was really, you know, I just very interested in space in terms of how important it was and, you know, and 
really went from there. Yeah. And did you see, well, for you, was there a big gap in the market in terms of like just maybe understanding or just the, the research and, and evidence behind it and, and, and the ability for marketing teams to track it? Yeah, no, we definitely thought there was a gap in the market for a specialist agency. Like there is obviously uh, a number of other consultants who do very good work and research uh, companies doing good, good work as well in the space. Um, but we felt there was, I suppose, that gap for a very much focused, distinctive brand asset consultancy who uh, live and breathe it every day, who, you know, understand the, the methodology and the, 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 the issues with the methodology as well when it's not done right. Um, but it really is to offer the consultancy and, you know, we can back it up with the case studies and that side of things, which really brings it to life. So uh, not only, you know, the numbers uh, in terms of what clients see, but also bring it to life in, uh, in the practicalities in terms of the recommendations. So um, definitely saw, saw a gap and, you know, we, we've been doing very well over the past while, which is brilliant. So um, it sort of shows there was a gap there for, for an offering such as ours. Yeah. And. One of the things I was interested in, you know, as I was thinking through, through our chat today was, you know, and I think, you know, came up recently, we will touch it again later on, maybe, you know, Mark Ritson kind of defending differentiation and, you know, definitely distinctiveness has, has become kind of something that's that to the fore over the last number of years, particularly, with, as you say, the work of Byron Sharp and, and Jenny Romania. But how important then do you think it is for people to understand, you know, almost the history of advertising? To get to the point of understanding the role of distinctiveness, like you've talked about brand codes I mean, mm. being a thing, and maybe it's just a, a more progressed research and language around it. But how, when you're talking to clients, are you getting into that kind of understanding their beliefs on marketing and, you know, I guess marketing history and theory and where, where they're at? Do you need to do some education or what, what's your kind of thoughts on, on that and, and role you might play? Yeah, so from an education perspective, I think, again, the work of, of, of some of the people you've mentioned already, like, you know, they've, they've landed very well, whether that's someone like Mark Ritson's MBAs or his, you know, all of, just his articles on the topic, and he's talked about brand codes for years. Um, so I don't think it's something new, per se, for marketeers. And um, the terminology and the probably the science and the research and the tracking behind it is probably newer to them. So that's the only piece sort of, you know, they need to wrap their head around. They get it in most cases in terms of importance, it, it, like it intuitively makes sense to a lot of people as well. Uh, you know, that was one of the big things as well when I was reading uh, Jenny's books initially was, yeah, this, this makes perfect sense in terms of, of um, how brands, you know, become distinctive and it helps them and helps them grow. So there isn't a, a massive education piece. Uh, you know, there's plenty of examples from the archives in, in a lot of brands, whether that's the Mitchell Manor, you know, example of Coca-Cola in the bottle and being able yeah. to find it in the dark, I think is, is often to be mentioned, but, um, people, they know what they are because they are a popular culture as well, whether that's, uh, mascots and jingles and all that side of things. So, um, they're not new. It's just the sort of the packaging of them, uh, as a, as a, a, a lever in marketing effectiveness, which is probably the new piece, uh, yeah. which we obviously help with, um, Oh, that's very much standing on the shoulders. It's great work of Rembrandt Bass and others. And you talk about, um, you know, on your site, you're kind of saying that there, there are very few, um, only the best research and track the, their, their brand assets o over time. And it, you know, gives you the assessment of your distinctive assets. So mm. talk to me a bit about that. You know, um, is it really only the few that are doing it? Um, well, like obviously the large, you know, large multi-brand uh, corporations, they, they do it in, 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 in some way. Um, but it's not always done in sort of from a, I suppose, a purest distinctivity methodology perspective. Okay. Um, what I see and have seen in the past is a lot of times it could be included, say, as a, a part of your brand health tracker. And yeah. whether that's in the sort of current guise of distinctive brand asset research or just in terms of questions. Um, like I've seen in brand health trackers, you know, you might have questions of, is it a standout brand? And then that's used as sort of metric for distinctivity. Um, so it's probably the wrong phrases or questions are being used to measure it in a lot of brand health trackers. And one of the biggest issues with using it as part of your brand health trackers, there's so much priming and bias going on. So like, you know, you can't really ask what prompted questions around um, brands in the category and then show the distinctive assets and ask people to, to try and recall them because there's Already at that point, you've highlighted the, the brands in the category and ultimately yeah. the bigger brands generally win out because they are most salient. Um, so they will over-index. So 
Um, like it is done, it's, it's been mo- done more and more, but not everyone, um, would do it in the, suppose the, the more robust methodology approach. Um, and one of the big things we offer is try to, you know, have that more cost effective method. And that's why we do syndicated trackers as well. So, um, you know, it's, you're not paying for the whole study per se, you're, you're buying into the results only of your own brand. So that does help, but especially from a tracking perspective, because it's different, like it can be expensive in some cases when you're talking across multiple markets, yeah. uh, you know, it's fine to do your initial dip and your initial research, but to do that every year, it's quite an undertaking and it is quite, ex- it then becomes quite expensive. And um, hence why the syndicated tracking over time does, does help with that cost as well. So, you know, not, there aren't that many brands you'd be surprised, I suppose, who are doing a robust annual distinctive brand asset tracking. Um, so in that perspective, there's not loads because again, costs would come into it. Um, but because they are so important, like it is, a, you know, it is quite key that you are tracking your brand assets over time. Like I always, I always think back in terms of, uh, back to client side as well, in terms of talking about your brand directors, KPIs and all that. And I like, you know, being short-term folks, I'm like, you know, a, a main KPI for a brand director should be how well their distinctive brand assets are because they're very long-term in nature. And, yeah. you know, that should be, uh. A, a really uh, a, the legacy of, of good brand directors in terms of the they've embedded and left behind a really strong distinctive asset that they that other future brand directors can use and reuse going forward and CMOs etc. I, I I like that actually and it, that's a huge challenge I think right in in the world of marketing and maybe even more so currently where everything's tight <laughs> you know budgets resource everything you know that for a, a brand director who sometimes is, you know, a combination of head of marketing and, you know, and, and trying and doing everything to kind of be able to, to focus on that and say, yeah, my goal is to leave, you know, very strong brand health mm-hmm. metrics when, you know, CEOs and CFOs and boards are saying, that's great, but like, where's the revenue coming yeah. from marketing? Are you helping brand directors and, and, and marketing leaders address that with their, with their boards? Are you, are you in having those discussions or, or enabling them to have those discussions? Yeah, well, like, uh, oh, the reports always find their way to the, the CMO for sure. And even depending on the, the nature of the company, when it's a very brand centric company and um, the CEO is very interested as well in terms of their assets. So they, I think it does help the conversation internally and um, having those metrics that you can, you know, look at in terms of where we, where, where we are at the moment and then where we want to go going forward. So it, it can be quite useful um, for for senior marketeers and um, having that KPI and having that metric available that they're able to show, you know, not just the ter- short term focus. In an ideal world, CMOs and, and brand directors and all that, like, you know, a lot of them might have bonuses and all that. And sometimes it can be just completely on short ter- short term profit. Yeah. You know, everyone's biased in some ways and everyone's selfish in some ways. So you can manipulate your bonus. <laughs> in many ways as well by, uh, you know, doing certain things. And that's when KPIs can, uh, I think it's God hearts low when a KPI becomes a target, becomes mean, meaningless because every, every, uh, you know, you can just manipulate stuff. So that KPI grows. And if you are only focused on say short-term revenue, um, as a KPI for your bonus, unfortunately it can be manipulated and it doesn't leave the brand or the company in a good spot going forward. Um, so it is important to have some, some longer term metrics in there, uh, that you are measured on and uh, whether that's attributed to your bonus or not, but it's just, it's in relation yeah. to what you need behind. I, do you think there's, do you think there's a need, you know, at kind of board level for more CEOs to understand this? Um, or, or do you think there's an understanding of the, of the power of these assets at that level? Cause I think, I think it's fine. Like we can do it within marketing, but how do we, how do we elevate the, the understanding? Like, do you see that as a need? Yeah, I think again, because it's, it's not it, it, people intuitively, it makes sense to people in terms of like things like slogans or characters. So I think from a cultural perspective, CEOs are well familiar with the strength of assets and uh, when they think back to, you know, jingles that might've been, you know, out here 20 years ago that are still yeah. out in the field or still remembered to this day, which is quite interesting. So I think the, they, they understand it. In the main, I think the strength of them, obviously they won't know the, the minutia of the detail of why it's important perhaps, or the detail of the tracking side of things. But I think in the main, they understand its importance, um, from an advertised perspective, 
um, from a pack perspective, it's obviously critical as well. So I, I think I think it's in a good spot. Um, obviously, the 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 more CEOs are familiar with the the concept of marketing, the marketing science side of things, and you know, actually the effectiveness side of things, the better for yeah. everyone. And um, because obviously they're you know a lot of times folks at the bottom line, and you know, it's much more useful when the CEO comes from a marketing background, of course. And then generally is a different conversation. So uh, I think it's not a t- in a terrible place, but it can always improve um, when, you know, C-suite are very familiar with the sort of the the, the effectiveness pillars of, of what makes a brand profitable uh, in the medium and long term. Yeah. Yeah. And having more, I think having conversations almost amongst themselves would be, you know, really, really beneficial. So it's probably the starting point, making sure all marketers understand. And then from there, yeah. How do we get the, the the next level of kind of board getting getting it as well? Yeah, and I think again the work of people of of Rimbra Bass of a bit of Beals uh, and Ritson and that it really does help. Uh, I know in my last uh, last drinks company I worked in William Grant, like we would have uh, rather than us talking about you know market effectors leaders, that's why we would have brought people in like Peter Fields and yeah. Mark Ritson because they just talk so well on it and you know it's it's much easier to get the buy-in when you have someone like Mark Ritson doing a presentation to country heads or C-suite and all that side of things so that's uh you know that that's incredibly powerful and useful as well uh in terms of getting people like that involved and and, and letting people hear from them and uh, it helps land it much better uh, it's always that saying you know it's not always what you say it's how you say it and uh, that's why people like Mark Ritson are brilliant when like you know we yeah. got him to do some presentations and Feedback is incredible from the non-marketing folk as well. And, right. you know, it really just helps uh, land some of the things that we were banging our heads against the wall for, for years. And then Mark Richardson says, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah that's great. And you're like, cool, thanks. Really? But, uh, yeah. That's, you know, that's, that's Mark. Yeah, it brings over from the outside in, which, yeah, exactly. you know, look, you're in that position now. So we're, we need to you know, bring Apple sure. in if you're struggling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned there the uh, purest methodology perspective to to measuring can you tell me a bit about that and how you apply that and i know you talk about four key areas under which you um you look at distinctive brand assets so i'd love to just understand kind of how you approach it what your purest methodology is and, and maybe the, touch on those four key areas yeah and it, it's again it's it's very much built on and uh, on the back of the methodology and the sort of marketing science from Arab and Bass in, in terms of like we use a, a, a format of the distinctive brand asset grid uh, a few different tweaks in the metrics in terms of how we do it but uh, similar enough approach in terms of understanding if people firstly recognize an asset and uh, secondly if people can correctly attribute that asset to a brand so obviously all when we do the research all our assets are debranded so uh, we would pull apart a brand and its icon and everything to do with whatever color, taglines, et cetera. Uh, anything that has the brand name is obviously debranded. And then uh, we, we we see the correct brand attribution in terms of if people can correctly recall the brand. Uh, and then also we look at misattribution, which is another very powerful metric in terms of understanding if brands assets are being misattributed to competitors, which you know a lot of times they are as well. So yeah. there are the three metrics, the, the main metrics that we use. Um, and you know it's a simple enough a methodology in many ways, but it's a great, great powerful story in terms of understanding how distinctive and stand out your assets are, or if assets, you know, what we find with many assets is that they're just very category generic in terms of they're, yeah. they're familiar, but can't really recall which brand they belong to. And we see this quite a lot with, with sort of your more generic category codes, uh, that just aren't very, you know, distinctive or ownable and, you know, in different categories, I worked in Irish whiskey, for example, um, like Greenfields. Very, very, you know, Greenfield and Valley is very difficult to own by a Scotch or Irish brand because yeah. so many brands have used them over the years. Not saying you won't use them ever in your advertising, but if you're leaning on a very, dist- you know, a very Greenfield, lots of valleys in your ad- adverts and it's not very well branded, more likely it'll be attributed to the category leader, like someone like Jensen or whoever uh, from a Scotch brand perspective. So you just need to be careful. You understand then what are the category codes that you just need to be mindful of um, or the gener- generic codes or the tropes that yeah. um, the category uses. So. Um, yeah, they're the main areas that we look at. Uh, I said it'd be quite simple, but powerful story in terms of breaking apart how distinctive your assets are. We look at it, obviously, at an asset type and comparing you against your competitors as well. It's obviously very important um, because, you know, you get so much value actually from your competitor assets. We always find and our clients always find that as well, where they're not as interested initially on the cl- competitor assets, but it actually okay. is massively useful one to prevent 
priming and all that, having multiple brands assets in there, but providing the right benchmarks. And you, you can learn a lot from your competitors in terms of who are, who's doing it well, or who's not doing it well, or what, you know, what to stay away from. And um, so it can be quite, quite very useful um, in terms of getting a full picture and, of, of the category and the brand and the assets are performing. Do you ever look outside category? Just, I'm just curious um, in the sense of, to that point of who did it well, there might be nobody in our category that's doing it exceptionally well. Do you yeah. ever look into related worlds and, and kind of use that as a, as benchmark? And there's sure related examples you can even think of, of, of people that are doing it really well. Yeah, no, we don't like, we always bring it to life with case studies from, from other categories as well, in terms of who's doing it well. Cause as you say, some categories just aren't very, you know, strong or distinctive. There's not many brands that are very distinctive. So we do have to bring it to life. Um, we generally always careful about comparing asset scores in the category study to the scores from another category, because there's a lot of things that can impact it, whether that's sample profiling, the category context. So we generally try to keep it within the context of the category in terms of when you're comparing for benchmarking. Well, yeah. definitely would bring in case studies from, from, from other brands and other categories in terms of who is doing it very well, uh, to help bring it to life. And because, you know, there is a very, very good brands out there doing distinctivity incredibly well with big brand assets. So, uh, really helping to inspire, um, with that quite useful. I was conscious as well, though, of making sure that it's relevant because, you know, it's easy to come in and say, oh, Netflix, everyone needs a sound audio or yeah, yeah. Like, does Netflix have one, but like Netflix have uh, a massive uh, distribution and everyone's sitting around where they're at and how many times are, did I already have to embed it, but you know, it's very, it's, it's hard for, for most brands to, to have a, an audio or a sonic DBA because they're not Netflix. So again, making it relevant and, and, uh, you know, what's feasible and possible within the nature of their category. Yes. Yeah. That's a very good, good point. Um, you know, because it is, that's a great example of a distinct brand asset, but like mm -hmm. every time you switch it on, you know, it's there, like all yeah. their programming has that, that, that sound and, yeah. um, it, it, it worked. Um, so just touching on that then in terms of the different types of distinctive brand assets that people can have, would you just maybe touch on those and, and maybe some examples that you can think of, 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 you know, the different types of distinctive brand assets. Obviously Netflix is one example. Yeah. What, what are those? So yeah, they really vary, I suppose the, you know, starting at the, the logo, which, you know, the, the elements of the logo, like your, your, your logo is nearly always going to be on pack or, uh, as part of your advertising and all that. So it's, um, you know, but it, we always test anywhere to understand, uh, would it, in its deep rounded form, how distinctive it is, but it's more, you know, the different elements and icons as part of your logo, uh, whether that's the Adidas tree stripes or whether that's, uh, you know, uh, the Burberry, um, the new nice and horse that they yeah. have reintroduced. So it could be from icons elements on your logo to on your pack or in your advertising. It could be characters, as we mentioned already. So characters are probably an obvious one for a lot of people in terms of, uh, that could be a real life brand ambassador, like, um, George Clooney to the Mitchell man. Um, so there's, you know, or from the Meerkats compared to market. Yeah. And then, so lots of that. examples of characters, an easy one to, to understand, um, taglines and slogans, um, are often, you know, distinct assets, but it's an interesting one. In reality, they're not very distinctive or ownable. It's very, very difficult to actually own a distinctive asset. Sorry, to own a tagline as a brand. And we find they normally fall more in the differentiation camp in terms of helping to communicate meaning. Uh, on, okay. And there's always examples of ones like Nike and all that, but in, in, it's, it's rarer that they're a distinctive, actually a distinctive asset than anything else. They're still obviously incredibly important, but it's just being clear in terms of what could be distinctive or not. Um, there's ad style, um, whether that's, you know, a simple lockup that might be used, like, you know, National Geographic have their yellow frame, but they obviously is on their magazine, but they use that in their advertising as well to frame their advertising. And that's, you know, consistently used well, um, or, you know, an ad style like Red Bull and their illustrative style that they use yeah. on TV. So that's, you know, ad style would be one as well. Um, mm -hmm. audio sort of touched on it as well, whether that's a Sonic, uh, Mark, um, the likes of Tadom from Netflix or a song. Um, and then, um, sort of the hybrid of Sonic and, and taglines would be the jingle. Um, so, you know, um, plenty of examples out there of that we've actually done some, some research on jingles recently and we'll, be, uh, oh. which has some interesting stuff on it as well. And just in terms of the power of them, um, in terms of jingles that mightn't have aired, as I mentioned, 
for 15, 20 years, and they still have yeah. like 80% correct brand attribution. Uh, and some of them are just incredible in terms of how sticky and they're, they're called airworms for a reason, I suppose, in terms of how sticky they are. Um, and yeah, I'm sure probably I forgot there's some more asset types, but they're, they're probably the main ones that we would, we would cover. Uh, obviously, you know, talked about pack and all that, uh, probably sometimes, uh, you know, so mainly important from a FMCG or CBG perspective in terms of pack, but having a distinct of pack is just a phenomenal yeah. weapon. And um, it's just, you know, I, I've worked on Hendrix Gin over the years and that, that brand, like it's a phenomenal brand in many ways, you know, it's a, a really good liquid, but the, the, the actual bottle itself, when it, you know, it still is iconic uh, in terms of how it stand out it was, but it was very different. The rest of the category when it was initially launched and that has been a, you know, a really, really phenomenal weapon for, for brand growth. Um, and you know, a lot of companies and brands know the strength of, of distinctive packaging, but unfortunately cost of goods, um, can often yeah. get in the way of a distinctive pack element, uh, which is unfortunate. And that's, you know, that's, you know, our job is helping, um, to prove the, the benefit and the worth of having a, a distinctive pack element that might be a couple of cent more per pack to, to use, but yeah. the payback can be quite phenomenal in terms of making sure that you have a standout pack and shelf, um, because that can drive so much growth. I still have a, a Hendrix gin, uh, teacup. Do you remember that when they did yeah, that? No, I've it's a long time background as well from my days working um, on Hendrix gin, yeah. yeah. Actually, I think I see a Hendrix bottle in the background, <laughs> do I? Like, um, that's right. It's a, a very distinctive bottle, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's brilliant. There's a, I don't know if it's a true story, but you know, we all, you know, don't let Truth get Truth's in the way. Get in the way. <laughs> Initially when the bottle was being created, there was a lot, again, I don't know how true it is, but I like to think it was true when it, you know, it was going through initial research or when it was being discussed at a, you know, a senior enough level uh, in terms of the bottle and being brought out, there was quite a, there was a, a, probably a lot of love and hate in many ways in terms of some people loved it and some people hated it. Um, and I think, well, the, the word is that when people heard that there was sort of lots of love and lots of hate, it's going, great, this, this is what we wanted, you know, a bottle that yeah. would stand out because it's like everything, whether that's creative or whatever, when it's sort of, that's fine. That's nice. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, it, when it's very vanilla, you probably, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's when something isn't going to be stand out. So, um, when there is a bit of, um, uh, you know, differences in opinion, um, that's probably a, a good thing in many ways, cause you know, you're onto something and hopefully you, you know, not going to please everyone, but I think the results of, uh, of that bottle has, has proven its worth over the years with the, with the growth of the brand. Yeah. Yeah, you want the yeah, you kind of need that friction, and then look, I think they did a, it's a great example because they did a wonderful job on, I think everything they did, like the tone of voice was different, you know the uh, the use of cucumber, like you know where did that go? I have no idea, right? But that was that was stand out for them, yeah. And the like you could sign up and get a pack sent out to you that had like a Hendrix notebook, and like it was just so it was so different, fresh, as you say, like out of you know, the category wasn't doing anything like it, or I didn't think they were. And, you know, so there was lots of elements there that they, that they built on. And I think that's maybe to your earlier point of like what you measured, there are lots of different elements that you can, that you can yeah. look at for your brand, brand assets. If, if somebody's listening to this and going, oh, wow, that's a bit overwhelming. Like, where would you recommend someone starts? From a, a, a brand tracking perspective, is it? Well, or even just thinking about like, you know, okay, we have this, we have our brand, we're kind of building it out, you know, we've done things We're, you know, we're ready to go to the next stage. Like, mm. like, you know, what should I be thinking about first in terms of like, what assets should I be thinking of building on first? Yeah. I th it's when you're starting a, uh, when a, a new brand, I think, well, even legacy or old brands, I think you, prioritization is the first step in terms of understanding what your hero assets or asset might be, uh, like the hierarchy of of your assets is very important. Uh, you know, you don't need in many cases, pens of assets. You might only need yeah. a couple or one. Uh, and I think once you understand the prioritization, the hierarchy of your assets, you're already on a good footing. And again, that's where the research helps in terms of, right, we know what our primary assets might be. These are our focus and all that. And then it feeds into your brand strategy or your, your brand plan and eventually your, your brand guidelines and that side of things. So. Um, that's always the first protocol. Um, and then it's, you know, obviously how you use it, uh, and the consistency point is always there in terms of making sure it's used consistently over a long time period, because they do take 
a while for brand assets to embed and, and, and media dollars in many cases. But, you know, one of it is just making sure how you have your brand assets, have that golden thread across all your touch points, whether that's on pack, inside your pack, in your advertising, uh, on shopper marketing, on your website, on digital, whatever yeah. it might be. So, um, you know, you, it's not rocket science in many ways to think of brand assets. It's sometimes it's, it's very simple in terms of just getting your brand code, brand asset, you know, aligned in terms of what it is or what one yeah. of you are. And hopefully there is a relationship between them, whether that's color or something like that. And then using it consistently, using it across every single touch point, uh, really heroing it creatively in your advertising and wherever you can and make it, you know, front and center of your creative brief. So it's, it's simple enough uh, when you boil it down in terms of what you need to do to embed a brand asset and, you know, and then it's just about having the, 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 the know-it-all not to be cutting it up or, or getting rid of it or, you know, thinking because it's everywhere that consumers know about it. And um, there's so many brands that we studied over the years where, you know, you hear back from teams going, I oh, yeah, like, you know, we're, we're sick of that asset X and um, let's, let's move on to something else. And then you actually do the research and you're like, oh yeah. So only like 10, 20% of category buyers actually, you know, can attribute it back to the brand. So, um, the, once you have your sort of plan laid down in terms of, you know, how you embed it across multiple touch of your touch points and how you're going to use consistently and creatively, it's about not messing with it until it's embedded. And sometimes that's hard because, yeah. you know, we, again, we love reinventing the wheel in marketing and uh, we love doing new stuff when it's not needed. You know, you just have to look at how many good adverts have been dropped too early when they're doing well. And then we create a new advert when it's not needed, you know? Yeah. And millions on it, but that can go into media. And, um, you know, yourself from, a, a you know, how the, the tenure of the CMO, and um, there is always that, you know, need in many ways to sort of reinvigorate the brand and often a brand logo or assets are some of the first things to, to be evolved when you have a, a new CMO come in. So it's, um, it can be difficult. I think, um, can't remember who said it, but there is some something I read re recently about like the best CMOs are the ones who go in and do just go, no, this is not being touched. This is yeah. brilliant. And I have the confidence as well to do it because it's the easiest thing is to just change things up and then you have a roadshow showing our great new design or whatever it might be. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's nearly harder to say, no, we're not touching that. We're going to focus on doing it X and Y over here instead because uh, we want to keep this consistent. Yeah, I completely, and I've, you know, been lucky to speak to a lot of people who've that exactly the same thing, like the, the best CMOs, maybe that's a stretch, but like the great quality in the CMOs to come in and, and understand that first, yeah. you know, and then go, okay, these are assets that we greedy leverage and sometimes even go back to because we've missed them. I, I spoke to Chris Allen from Two Eats, um, new in Australia, and they, they kind of refreshed the brand recently and they did a lot of the research on what their distinctive assets were and like what you were saying, some of the jingles that are 20 years old and they went, they did their research and the, you know, the, the jingles from the eighties, people still associated with the brands. They're like, if we refresh this, yeah, like we're, we're, we're kind of giving ourselves already kind of a head start on, on, you know, our investment. And so it was, you know, a really clever and smart way to kind of go back and go forward at the same time. Definitely. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, when we're doing research, we always Clients always ask us, like, you know, how far back can you go? And we're like, you can go 10, 20 years in some cases, but definitely we always suggest having a look through the archives in terms of what might be there um, that you might need to revigorate. Like, I love the case study from Weedabix. Um, it's on Warp and, and elsewhere in terms of the, it's called Rembrandt in the Attic in terms of how they re, you know, found again some of the distinctive elements they had and some of their advertising that they had and, uh, in terms of rolling that out. So, that was, I think, a really nice case study in terms of what can be in the archives that you can bring back to life or reuse again. That can be quite powerful. So yeah, again, we, we, we do get rid of stuff unnecessarily. Uh, jingles are probably one of the, the things that we have got yeah. rid of. And, you know, there's a variety of reasons why I think uh, jingles have probably been relegated from, from Mark as much as, as they were. Um, so yeah, definitely. You can, there's, a, there's a lot in the history uh, that can, can be reused. The kind of creatively became less fashionable. You did, you, you do some great articles and they're on your, your website and I know you post them on LinkedIn as well. There was one 
maybe a couple of months ago, but but recently enough about the was it the debranding of of brands like Blanding. I think yeah, yeah there was that word was used. I'd look and definitely um I link to it in in the show notes because it's a great one. But you you showed um was it old and new uh, logos that brands have gone to with it? Anyway, you, you explain it better than I Yeah, guess. so I suppose over the past years, again, um, there's been a number of pieces, about, I suppose, about the branding uh, in terms of how a lot of logos and brand worlds have been simplified uh, and a variety of reasons have given up for that, uh, whether that's, you know, mobile consumption, the need to, you know, have less pixels available. So you need to squeeze things together, whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, a lot of brands have really simplified their logos and we look at the Pre, the before and after for a lot of those logos that were, uh, you know, modified recently and simplified recently. And, you know, the results really just show how a lot of them have oversimplified in terms of losing certain distinctive elements. There are some obvious examples like the, the Intel Swirl, which, you know, was, you know, very, very highly embedded yeah. and really strong brand attribution. They no idea why, but that was relegated and uh, the differences in terms of brand attribution between the old and new logo was quite, yeah, quite big. Um, so there's lots of examples there. And, you know, one of the things with these type of brands, they more likely will pull their brand scores for their de-branded logo back up over time with enough, you know, media donors and, and, yeah. and time and reach and all that side of things. Like for me, the biggest, I suppose, takeaway for that piece was more around how brands don't use their logo for embedding icons or characters or elements where it's a, a, like your logo is obviously used so everywhere on pack, you know, on an app icon and, uh, and all your yeah. advertising. When it's simplified to like just text, you lose so much because you lose the ability to embed an icon. I think the Burberry example is the one to be the stand out where yeah. they move. Yeah, and again, this quite, happened quite a lot with fashion brands where they had different emb emblems or icons as part of their logo, which, you know, might have some okay um, to good uh, brand attribution and usage to very just plain font, which, you know, isn't very inspiring due to design trends. And then they reinvigorated and brought back the, the Burberry Night. Uh, and I suppose the benefits of that, if they obviously reuse their, that logo everywhere, that night as an individual icon will yeah. have strength. And then that icon can use, you know, elsewhere, uh, instead, not instead of the logo, but as well as the logo to help the brand stand out and make their advertising ultimately more effective. So that for me was the biggest, um, I suppose, takeaway from that in terms of it, the logo is a brilliant embedding vehicle for other icons or characters or whatever it might be that then can be used as branding devices going forward. Yeah. I, it's, it's also interesting just the graphic that you had when you look at it, it's just kind of sameification. I think yeah. everything was just starting to look the same. And you're like, wow, where's the, you know, where, where's the distinctiveness? I know. Yeah. And it's, 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 it is funny. Like, you know, and it, it, some of it, some of it is down to design trends and you can probably see it in other, yeah. in different things. Like, you know, uh, I think it's changed in recent, but like, you know, with hipster culture, whatever that word means, like you can see coffee shops just all become the same in yeah. multiple countries or whatever, like all our coffee shops are quite similar. So it happens where there's a design trend that everyone sort of gravitates towards it. And I think, but then. People flip it again and maybe, you know, it was maybe Burberry is an example of a brand who flipped it back. And even I think Warner Brothers, they obviously simplified their logo. Like, you know, maybe it's a nostalgia thing, but the Warner Brothers logo, when you saw it on screen and the, the Richardson the nostalgia that that brought. Yeah. And the, the updated one, it wasn't very inspiring, but I think they actually have, um, bro, they're going to bring back the old sort of more layered version, which is good as well. So uh, I think, you know, again, with the zigging and zag, once there's a zig, there's always a zag as well. So I think, um, hopefully people will, will go back and understand that the, you know, having that layered, uh, logo is good. But again, for me, it is, it is around like, you know, if you're having another distinctive asset, whether that's a character, whether just an icon or whatever, uh, you know, you add it to your logo make sure it's front and center of your logo so you can embed it and then use it in different ways going forward. Yeah. And, and look, you can also understand the, you know, organizations wanting to make sure their, their, their assets don't look tired. I, I like, I get that. And so that kind of idea of freshness and, you know, refreshing is, is, is important, but as you know, the brand Jim, Dave Taylor would say, it's like, it's fresh consistency. And yeah. I mean, that's so key is kind of making sure you're not losing. They have a brilliant article about Mr. Kipling actually on that, 
that point. So that's worth it. Yeah, no, it's, it is, it's a, it's a great, uh, it, it is, it makes perfect sense in terms of like, you know, not reinventing the wheel. You can, li- you, you know, you can, you can overdo it in many cases and, you know, they're you know, a freshening up of your brand, you know, it, it, it is always required, but again, I would say this, but this is when you do DBA research to understand what to keep and, yeah. you know, what potentially could be evolved or tweaked or, you know, potentially what could be let go and it doesn't really matter. So, um, you know, which is as important that. actually, Kyle, I think what, you know, you, you should all, you should also be knowing like, what can you let go? Because that might allow you to be more focused on actually the things that, that are working. Cause you may have too many. A hundred percent. Um, and, and, and that comes right from logos as well. Like there was input bias in some ways with the logos that we put into that, uh, the research. Um, but there's some examples of brands who just like, they tidied up their logo. I think post for example, was one where just, you know, they cleaned it up a little bit and actually the new logo scored higher than the yeah. old one in terms of that side of things. So there, you know, there's always opportunities to tweaking. I think, you know, unfortunately most brands and, mm. you know, in marketing, I think we probably overdo it. Um, uh, but it, you know, it doesn't mean we, you should keep the same forever. Like, you know, most iconic brands out there have evolved over time, but it's, it's gradual versus a whole, you know, completely new, uh, yeah. new identity or whatever it might be. Well, I mean, the famous one being, and I spoke, got to speak to, to Debbie Millman, who, who designed the very first Tropicana one, but that's such a famous one of like really throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. No, no, it's, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. It's an interesting case study in terms of, of where to go. And again, it's a, probably a, we, an overused case study by us, but it's always a, it's, it's a great one in terms of understanding, like, you know, what's distinctive about your path. And that's, we do, that's, you know, a big part of our research is understanding what's distinctive about your pack. So when you are doing a pack refresh, you know, what you can protect, what you can evolve, what you could potentially relegate uh, from your pack that isn't distinctive or helping you stand out. And uh, because otherwise you're just doing it based on, you know, your, your gut, which always goes, yeah, that was the right thing. Um, there is always like a lot of things, there's always the art and science um, from a creative perspective. And actually a lot of creative and agencies and branding agencies we work with, they actually know a lot of what we do. Like, you know, sometimes from a research perspective, when you, uh, it's, you know, people working in, in the creative industry, but as creative director, they mightn't like, they're like, oh, that's crap, don't need that. But actually a lot of what we do, it sort of, you know, it helps reinforce a lot of what creatives loves doing, which is creating obviously very standout, distinctive work. Yeah. So. It provides some of that science, um, the helps back. So, you know, a lot of great work that they do. So, uh, and that could be from a packaging perspective in terms of, you know, how many times is, uh, has a, an agency brought to the fore some very distinctive packaging, but it's been shot down uh, and uh, our work helps prove the case for, for the benefit of doing it. But again, there's always the back on your shoulder behind you, there's always someone shouting cost of goods, cost of goods. Cost. So. <laughs> That's about getting the balance right, I guess. Yeah. Um, we, we touched on earlier on, and, and I do want to maybe get into it a bit more, is the, your views on differentiation. Y- mm. You you mentioned earlier on the context of actually, you know, that that part of your, your brand may be more help. You know, the, I think with the tagline you said helps maybe with differentiation. Um, and obviously there was the, you know, Ritson did his webinar recently on in defense of differentiation. Obviously then that, you know, caused disruption amongst the, you know, the, the marketing elders, people going, you know, can't. I don't think it's one thing or the other was, was, yeah. was his, his point, but I'd love, you know, Cantor, you know, was saying that, you know, for them being different has legs largely thanks to his connection to pricing power. So yeah. where, where are you on it? Because like you're a distinctiveness agency, but are you also helping people understand differentiation? Yeah, I think we we definitely like we are uh, first and foremost a distinctive agency, uh, and we I suppose our viewpoint or my viewpoint anyway is that I'd probably be sort of closer to Marx, you know, when he he has, sometimes has a map of where different things fall. Yeah. I, I think uh, I I suppose agree with a lot of Marx says in that space in terms of like you know differentiation is still important. Um, to be fair to Ehrenberg Bass and and Byron Sharp, like I think. They, it all gets overplayed when it says differentiate isn't important. Like, you know, I always get confused by this because I don't think they ever said it wasn't important. It's just not as important as we all made it out to be, you know, with the purpose conversations and all that. So, yeah. um, I don't think what could be right, wrong, but I'm pretty sure they never said it's not important. So I think, you know, both are important. Uh, I suppose the weight of the importance varies between different people. And um, we're very much focused on the distinctivity side of things, but we are very conscious on the differentiation, differentiation side of things as well. 
And, uh, you know, some people say there's no difference, but like there, there, there is in terms of what they do and the they're, they're believers, they're bedfellows, they, there is a relationship there. And, um, you know, our work very much understands the distinctivity around certain assets. Um, and as I mentioned, taglines, for example, if it's distinctive or not in terms of use as a branding device, you stand out. Um, so what we would see is that a lot of, you know, statements of pack or whatever, they don't have any role in distinctivity, but they're more likely to play in a category code role in terms of communicated meaning. So, yeah. you know, we're not saying don't use it on pack, you know, we're just saying be clear on the role of that device and uh, for your brand going forward. And, you know, like anything, it's important to be, to, to clarify what certain things might do. So, um, you know, certain icons or elements or characters like, you know, they might be nearly purely a distinctive, distinctiveness, uh, lever versus playing a role in differentiation where it might be. So I think both are important. Obviously we very much focus on the distinctivity side of things, but definitely wouldn't, you know, we don't um, negate the, the importance of differentiation as well. I think the conversation is again in, a, in an interesting and probably a good spot to where it was in terms of where we went down the rabbit hole of purpose and, and that side of things where it went too far down uh, in terms of, of, of where it is. And again, thanks to the likes of Brian McBass and others, and hopefully some of the work we do, it's, um, it's really hard. I like the importance of distinctivity to brands as well. So, you know, like anything in life, it's a, a, a balance is required yeah, for sure. I think so. And to be fair, I think that's what was, you know, the, the point of a lot of what I think Ritza was, was saying, like we went down, you know, differentiate or die was what people, yeah. And that's why, you know, kind of yeah. when we were talking earlier on, is the importance of understanding marketing history and advertising history of like where those principles came from. So like mm. we lived in a world of differentiation being so important because that was the Bible. And then, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if we went or have gone that far with distinctiveness. I think it became really important discussion that, you know, needed to be had. And so, yeah, I agree. It is, it's a, it's a balance and, and understanding that, and, you know, I think probably you're having those conversations and even saying to people, no, that's not a distinctive asset. Is as important, you know, cause it's helping yeah. you differentiate you, but it's not a distinctive asset is exactly. So like it, it's like you know, there's always sort of category codes that might be on pack that are very useful for category navigation. And what we will help is uncover if it's actually ownable or distinctive, because yeah, if, you know, there's no point trying to own a category generic code or something that's used by five, 10 other brands. And, you know, it could be again, incredibly useful and important on your pack. So you do need to keep it, but it's not going to be the branding device going forward because it will be just attributed to one or many players in the brand. So it's about, you know, the research really helps in terms of clarity uh, on your assets in the broadest sense and understanding what are distinctive and then what might play a different role, uh, whether at the, you know, category code or differentiation, differentiation, differentiation role or in some way you should be able to say that. Yeah, I know I should be, but uh, there's a lot of words I can't say. Um, there is, uh, yeah, and then some, some assets probably do straddle both camps in, in many ways, but again, you know, it's, it's rarer, rarer, I think, than, than we think. Uh, are there any, are there any things that just aren't ownable? I mean, sometimes color comes up like is you know, color ownable. It, like, like example that are, but it's harder probably. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I suppose it's the, the nature of the research as well, but like we do see color difficult to own in isolation on its own, unless you're certain brands, but even like we did some case studies on Deliveroo, they had very, very strong color ownership around their color teal. Um, and that's why we, when we're doing the study, like we might include color, but we also include variants of assets. So that might be a grayscale version of, you know, advertising, logo, lockups, whatever it might be to understand the uplifts between the grayscale and the color variant. And what you do see then is you can also see then the importance of color. So again, the National Geographic example, if you just show on yellow, uh, the scores probably wouldn't be very powerful, but then yellow and square, that is incredibly powerful. So yeah. in isolation. Yeah, it's hard to own for most brands, but it's, you know, it, it's how it works with other devices where color really comes into its own. So, um, you know, it's it, like your, like your background and use of red and yellow and on that side of things, you know, every time I'm on Twitter or LinkedIn, you know, I instantly, your posts or whatever jump out because of that, you know, color usage as well. So I think there is a, a, a I think you definitely own the color red uh, in the space of podcasts, which is great. And, uh, but uh, I think, you know, it can be quite powerful uh, when it's used right. But, again, you know, there is, there is examples out there, but to say we will only own, you know, color and then only have it as a small part of your brand is 
it's not going to work. The delivery was a good example of how they are just very consistent across touch points. It's a bit of a different color as well, which helps. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it is possible, but again, it's how it works with other types of assets as well, not overlap and uh, the, the, the linkage between them. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we're, near, we're nearly at time, but who, who's doing it well? Like, and it could, if I'm, we're, I'm open here to you talking about clients. Do you think it well? Yeah. Like there is one that recently comes to mind. We did a bit of work with Lipton, um, and they are, you know, a, an iconic brand in many ways in terms yeah. of they've just been very consistent and they do what we talk about the golden thread very well, where they have their, their logo and their icon and their cartouche and different elements of their logo. It's, a, it's everywhere. So it's on their pack, obviously it's those elements are in their logo, but you know, even internally in terms of the product, they have it on their T label. Um, like there's that golden thread of consistency from, you know, the pack to the shelf to, to advertising, et cetera. So that's just an example in terms of the salient example that comes to mind in terms of doing it well. Those examples out there, probably the obvious ones are the, the likes of, uh, of Red Bull, who, you know, again, quite consistent and they have a, a variety of assets as well. So, you know, you need to be careful as well when you start creating new assets when you've embedded it, but like they have obviously their sort of icons and their, on their bull asset, but they also have a very distinctive ad style. And yeah. so I think definitely, yeah. and again, the likes of in, in the food delivery space, um, the likes of Deliveroo and I think Just Eat are a, a, a lovely example as well of like brands who are quite distinctive. And what I like about Just Eat is obviously they, you know, it hasn't been easy for them in many ways because they've had a bit of a global consolidation of multiple local markets and that whole messiness yeah. that comes with a little bit of harmonization, which is all difficult. Um, but they're quite clever in terms of how, you know, their use of jingle and tagline and um, their use of ambassadors to embed it. And I always find it yeah. an interesting case study in the use of Snoop. And, uh, you know, the very, we, because we res- researched it and Snoop had phenomenal uh, scores from a brand attribution perspective, just these, really? but like, I don't know, I, I can't remember the top of my head, I think we're making 5 million or, you know, a bit you're wrong with that in terms of the fees paid for it, but like, it'd be very diff- difficult to keep paying Snoop every year. And then he's not going to be like, you know, he's not going to be around forever either as an asset. But what they did well is they used Snoop and Katy Perry of embedding the jingle. So they used those as devices yeah. of embedding another brand asset. So I thought that was, uh, you know, a, a smart play in terms of how they, they did it. So, you know, there's plenty of examples out there, I think. Uh, I love, we always use the example as well in National Geographic and even in like, you know, boring categories like EY, you know, they're, they're, yes. you know, yeah. they're generally there might be many can winners about EY, but you know, they are very, very consistent brands. Yeah. Uh, they obviously you introduced a new brand name, what, 10 years ago at this point, but, uh, you know, they're consistent in their use of the simple, some simple devices. And, um, and again, it's simple enough. Uh, when, yeah. Like, and you pull it down in terms of what you do. Like, obviously, they will never have a no singing, no dancing character. Um, and yeah. uh, in terms of their space, I think they do do it well. Yeah, they're not going to have a Duolingo bird, but it's a, <laughs> it, that's a great one. Actually, I remember when they they did that because Ernst Young were just such a that that was such a well known name. You're like, oh god, what? Like this is big. So that was a very big move for them to, you know, obviously business transformation. I think was was part of that. But they, as you said, they. They've really been consistent over such a long period of time to, to bet it. And that, you know, you've made that point a couple of times. This isn't something that you're going to do today. And then next month say, oh, you know, here's our, here's our distinctive brand assets. You know, like we're doing incredibly well. It's going to take time and an investment. And so I guess as we, as we kind of finish up and, you know, maybe someone listening to this today, who's who's maybe still, we touched on it before, but starting on this journey might need to convince, you know, people in the business that this is something that you do. Maybe it's a, you know, small or medium sized business that's trying to think about this. What advice would you give somebody about starting this, where to go? Maybe there's stuff they should read or, or, or things like that, that somebody could, could leave with today. Yeah. Like, you know, was it from a reading perspective? I was just, uh, it's when I've had client calls a lot of times I ask, have you read the book? Because in this instance, there is the book in terms of Jenny, Jenny Romnick's book. So I think that's definitely the first port of call in terms of, uh, reading a seminal book on the topic. Um, from a suppose, practical perspective in terms of what to do, it's, it's some of the, the pieces we spoke about already in terms of that hierarchy and prioritization in terms of understanding, right, what are the assets we're going to use going forward and then making a plan for embedding them. So again, I think the point is as well, like 
it probably gets talked about quite a lot in terms of distinctive assets. And a lot of people might go, yeah, they're important to our business. They're important in terms of growth, but they don't really have a plan for how they grow. So it doesn't might right. sit anywhere. It might just maybe have a small piece as part of your brand's triangle slash onion slash whatever keyhole, whatever you use. Um, but it needs more than that. It needs to be, you know, you understand what are the key ones going forward, how we're going to use them across touch points, how, what, what, you know, how focal or central is it going to be to your brief in terms of your creative agency? So, it, it, you know, some of the words or takeaway words is always around like pay your assets, consistency and prioritization, you know, having that golden trend. So again, it's not rocket science in many ways in terms of what you need to do. You just need to be consi- consistently use them well across touch points and be as creative as you can. Brilliant. Carl, listen, what a great point to leave it at. I really appreciate your time today. Um, I will definitely add links in to say some brilliant articles that you, you have and research that you share. So it's definitely a good place for people to, to start as well is, is going to your site and, uh, and reading out the information that you guys are sharing. So thank you so much. Great to, great to have you with us. Cheers, Connor. Thanks a million. Take care. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Cahill. I think it's respective that the role of a brand director is to leave the legacy of a really strong brand and distinctive asset that other future brand directors can use and reuse going forward. It's a really interesting one. Of course, it isn't the only thing to be done, but it's definitely a great challenge to think about as a brand owner. If you haven't already, I would recommend checking out some of the articles on their site and I have links in the show notes. So that is it for this episode. Thanks for listening to That's What I Call Marketing. If you did enjoy, please do share, subscribe, add comments with feedback. You can get in touch with us and find all previous episodes on That's What I Call Marketing.com. Follow us on Instagram on That's What I Call Marketing and on Twitter at That's underscore marketing. And you can watch these episodes back on YouTube. And yes, you guessed it. Just look for That's What I Call Marketing. So until the next time, for me, Connor Byrne, thanks for listening.